Welcome everyone to tonight's uh, Zoom presentation, Women Voted Here Before Columbus with Dr. Sally Roche Wagner. Uh, my name is Patrick Stentorn and I am the Director of Interpretive Programs here at the Albany Institute. Uh, tonight I am also joined uh, by my colleague Victoria Waldron, uh, who is listed on our participant list under Albany Institute of History and Art Education. Uh, Victoria is on the call to help with any technical issues during the presentation. So if you should have any uh, problems with your video, with your microphone, being able to hear or see anything uh, on tonight's program, please feel free to send a message in the chat box to Albany Institute of History and Art Education in Victoria. We'll be happy to assist you. Uh, tonight's program is the third in a series, uh, which is celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in the United States. Uh, which will be marked, uh, the exact anniversary will be marked tomorrow, Women's Equality Day, August 26th, which marks the date that the 19th Amendment was certified to the United States Constitution. Uh, the series will continue tomorrow uh, with a musical performance of suffrage music by the musicians of Malwick at 3 p.m. And on Thursday, We'll have a program of an interview between Elizabeth Cady Stanton as portrayed by Dr. Melinda Gruby uh, and Mary Berry of the League of Women Voters of Albany County. If you're interested in either of those programs, please visit our website, albanyinstitute.org for more option, for, for more info, for more options, for more info. Uh, just a reminder that tonight, for tonight's presentation, please mute your microphone. If you are using a device with a uh, video that is optional, you can turn it on or off. We will host a Q&A session at the end of tonight's presentation. If you have a question for Dr. Wagner at the end of her talk, please feel free to type it into the chat box and I will read all questions to Dr. Wagner at the end of the presentation. Tonight's program was funded in part by Humanities New York. Uh, with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, just a quick blurb that I have to read for uh, mm -hmm. as a uh, credit for the funding. Every speaker view that you're showing the video stream of this. And uh, Tonight, I am glad to be able to have Dr. Wagner with her, with us. I first met Dr. Wagner uh, when I was a park ranger out in Seneca Falls at Women's Rights National Historical Park. Uh, the topic she's going to be discussing today is one that um, is of great interest to me. I did a lot of my uh, graduate studies in Native American history, and it's a topic that I find um, many people are not aware of, and I find it very fascinating. Uh, Dr. Wagner was awarded one of the first doctorates in the country for work in women's studies and a, is a founder of one of the first college level women's studies programs in the United States. Dr. Wagner has taught uh, women's studies courses for 50 years and she currently serves as an adjunct faculty member in the Syracuse University Renee Crown University Honors Program. She wrote the faculty guide for Not Ourselves alone, uh, Ken Burns's documentary on Elizabeth K. Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, and has appeared in that film and numerous history films and radio programs. She was selected as one of 21 leaders for the 21st century by Women's E! News in 2015, and she serves on the New York Suffered Centennial. Dr. Wagner is a prolific author, in her anthology, The Women's Suffrage Movement with a foreword by Gloria Steinem unfolds a new intersectional look at the 19th century women's rights movement. Sisters in Spirit, Haudenosaunee influence on early American feminists documents the surprisingly unrecognized authority of Native women who inspired the suffrage movement. It will be followed by her forthcoming young readers book, We Want Equal Rights, How Suffragists Were Influenced by Native American Women. I apologize if you can hear the beagle outside barking. Uh, Dr. Wagner is also the founder and executive director of the Matilda Jocelyn Gage Center for Social Justice Dialogue in Fayetteville, New York, 
And if you have not visited that site, I highly suggest you do so. And she received the Catherine Coffey Award for Outstanding Service to Museology from the Mid-Atlantic Association of Museums in 2012. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wagner. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that I, uh, I, Patrick, I'm delighted to be working with you again. Uh, you, you've moved to the other side of the state, <laughs> but uh, really pleased to see the work you're doing and, and thank you for inviting me. Um, relative to your dog, I have two cats who uh, are very fond of photobombing. So if you see a cat walking across the, the screen, <laughs> pay no mind. Um, you said the forthcoming book, and I realized I didn't get a chance to tell you before we begin. The book is out. Uh, this is, um, yeah, just came out this week. Uh, we Want Equal Rights, and it's the Hoda Nishoni, how, how suffragists influence the uh, women suffrage uh, leaders. And um, it, uh, it's for young people. We were getting a lot of requests for Taking Sisters in Spirit, this first book that I did on the Haudenosaunee influence and actually uh, turning it into um, a book for young people. So we did that. So where do we begin? When I was uh, asked by, well, Penguin Classics, I'll, I'll start at the beginning of, of, uh, of this story. Uh, Penguin Classics, an editor, got in touch with me and said, uh, know you teach a, a class on the women's suffrage movement, and I wonder what you use for your textbook. And if you don't have anything, what would you like to see? And the first thing off my fingers and onto the keyboard in response was, well, I want something that doesn't begin when white people get here because Haudenosaunee women, indigenous women, have had political voice on this land for a thousand years while we're celebrating a hundred in 2020 in the United States. Well, Penguin said, great, do it. And the women's suffrage movement, this anthology, actually begins with the Haudenosaunee influence with extensive writings by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, uh, some by Lucretia Mott and uh, Alice Fletcher, suffragists, that I, in my research, I found to be the most influenced. So how could there have been an influence? Well, I will tell you that if you're skeptical, you can't be half as skeptical as I was when I began to do this uh, research, trying to, my goal is to figure out how did Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who was uh, an important suffragist, she was equally important with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The three of them were considered the triumvirate of leadership of the National Woman Suffrage Association from its beginning in 1869 until it merged in 1890 into the National American Woman Suffrage Association. I'll be talking about that group in a while. And Gage was an activist and a writer. Susan B. Anthony had a writer's block, couldn't write anything. And she said when she took pen to paper, she felt like she was on stilts. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the writer, but she really hated conventions. And so we have with Matilda Jocelyn Gage, the sort of best of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony combined. She was both an activist and uh, she was a, um, a writer. She and, 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 and Stanton uh, co-edited, co-authored, uh, most of the major documents of the National Women's Suffrage Association. And the, they edited the history of women's suffrage with the help of Susan B. Anthony as an, an editor. Um, she arranged for publication. So Gage is important, and Gage becomes really important in this story. And the writing out of Gage from history is the reason that we never got the story of the Haudenosaunee influence on women's rights. 
how did these women know the Haudenosaunee? Well, these women are all, except for Alice Fletcher, in this area. Lucretia Mott in 1848, the summer of 1848, she visits the Seneca community in Cataraugus. Cataraugus is one of the Seneca communities. She comes as a representative of the Philadelphia Friends Meeting. It's not exactly, you wouldn't call it a, a missionary, but you would call it a supporter. The Quakers had um, supported the Seneca for a number of years and had attempted to help them save their land. And now the Seneca were considering changing their form of government. And Lucretia Mott and her husband James spend time with the Seneca at Cataraugus. She goes from Cataraugus to, guess what? Plan the Seneca Falls Convention, the first local women's rights convention that we uh, that we cite in history. The idea of women's rights was pretty old by 1848. There was a lot of activity that had happened to that point. But as far as we know, this was the first group of women meeting locally to discuss it. I found one report that Lucretia Mott wrote about the Seneca Falls Convention. And in it, she writes for three paragraphs on her time with the Seneca Nation at Cataraugus. She writes about how she listens to the, the leadership, both men and women, making the political decision. She watches, she describes watching the uh, clan mothers, the women plan and carry out the strawberry ceremony, one of the sacred ceremonies. This was at a time when there were no denominations in the United States, Christian denominations in which women were allowed in the pulpit. The, the teaching of St. Paul that women shall keep silent in the churches was observed by all of the Christian denominations. Quakers were the one exception, but they didn't have a pulpit. Anyone could speak uh, freely as they wished uh, in the uh, Quaker meetings. So the uh, amazing thing that Lucretia Mott saw was a world so different than the one that she occupied. And she writes about it in her article to the Liberator, the anti-slavery paper, in three paragraphs. And there's one little paragraph on the Seneca Falls Convention. Now, I don't know if that's the relative weight that she paid to each of these, but she was clearly very taken by and, and amazed at what she observed with Seneca women. Well, what was the difference? What was going on with the women of the Six Nation Haudenosaunee Confederacy? You know, the, uh, I think they've also been called the uh, Iroquois by the French. That's a um, pejorative term. Uh, and the British call them the Six Nations, but they call themselves the people of the Longhouse. And that, that metaphor has meaning both politically, socially, and in terms of family. The Seneca women were among the Six Nations. And just to review your fourth grade education, if we start with the Eastern Door, we begin with the Mohawks, keepers of the Eastern Door of the Longhouse, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the center of the Confederacy, I am on Onondaga original homelands, the Aboriginal homelands of the Onondaga in Syracuse, New York. Then we have the uh, Cayuga and finally the Seneca, the keepers of the Western Door. And the Tuscarora are added, they joined the Confederacy in 1713. So these six nations, the women, have the authority and the responsibility of choosing the chiefs, holding them in office, the sachem, and removing them if necessary. Well, how does this work? The longhouse is traditionally where the families lived. And it was the clan family that consisted of the mother, the father, the sisters, 
the sisters' husbands, the children of the sisters, and the unmarried brothers. When the brothers married, they would go off to live with their wives' family in the longhouse. So the clan mother, the probably oldest, usually, uh, woman in the clan, she's watching these boys. Well, all of the women are watching the boys because they're raising them collectively, raising the children together. And the women begin to see, here is a boy, here is a grandson who watches out for everybody, who pays attention to other people's needs, who doesn't put himself forward, but really puts the needs of the people first. The clan mother will probably begin to groom him and begin to prepare him to become the chief when the old chief passes. The clan mother holds the symbol of authority. It's, it's a deer horn and she is given that symbol of the chief's authority when he passes and she then has the responsibility for nominating the one who will succeed him. She goes to the rest of the women. Do any of you know any reason why this man, or this, this young man that I've chosen, should not be the chief? And they've all really talked about it and considered it. Everyone has a voice ultimately in the clan. There are three absolute things that someone cannot have done if they're to be considered as the chief. One is that they cannot have committed a murder, they cannot have committed a theft, and they cannot have abused a woman or a child. So the clan mother puts him in his position, and if he gets off the path, if he begins to do something that is not meeting the needs of the people and looking to the seventh generation and their needs in every decision, the clan mother brings him back on the path, really tries to guide him back. And she gives him a warning and helps him come back on the path. If he strays again, she gives him a second warning and helps guide him back. If he strays a third time, she has the responsibility and she alone has this responsibility to remove him from his office, to take the horns away from him and to then place them on a man who is worthy of that position. Elizabeth Cady Stanton speaks to the National Council of Women. She has a speech that she gives uh, to be delivered at the National Council of Women in 1891. And in it, she talks about the clan mothers having this responsibility. And she uses the phrase, he cut off the horns. The clan mother has the right to cut off the horns of the, uh, of the chief. And um, that, of course, resonated, I'm sure, with feminists at the time, as it did with the feminists uh, years ago when I spoke at the uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton birthday tea in Seneca Falls, the annual event. And I spoke with a clan mother at that time, and I gave the phrase, cut off the horns from, uh, from Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and I talked about the right of the clan mother. Well, Audrey Shenandoah, the clan mother, got up and said, you know, I have the responsibility to remove the chief if, if he does stray for the third time. But it's the saddest thing that I could ever think of doing. I haven't seen it. It would make me sadder than anything because it would mean that we have strayed so far, that we have lost our harmony and balance. And it was such a different interpretation. So when Audrey and I were, you know, we were talking about it later and I said, what's the difference? I talk about rights and you talk about responsibilities that you have. And we decided that the difference was that rights are what you speak about in their absence, while responsibilities are what you have when you have a culture that experiences and practices gender equality, a balance of, of responsibilities, neither one above the other, but a balance and harmony is created in the process. Well, in that speech, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton also refers to divorce. Now, she has taken a position early on 
30, almost 30 years, I guess it was 30 years before, she's taken the position publicly that if women's lives are in danger from their husbands, their, their battering husbands, they should be able to leave a marriage. And if love is not present in the marriage, they should be able to get a divorce. And she is just taken to task for this position for, for suggesting this. The reason being that the prevailing Christian belief at the time was that marriage was not a civil arrangement between two people. It was actually a covenant with God. And you don't break a covenant that you've made with God. And so she was called a heretic. She was really uh, taken, taken to the carpet for suggesting that women should be able to save their lives by getting out of a dangerous marriage. She talks about, in her 1891 speech, about divorce Indian style. And she says, the wife will take his belongings and put them outside of the longhouse, and that's it. That's the end of it. He's, he's done. He's gone. And she describes this in a way that it's clear. She envies what's going on there. Well, let's look at another situation where women are gathering, uh, this time internationally. Uh, the other was the National Council of Women. This is the International Council of Women in 1888. This is the very first time that women from the Western nations have gathered on United States soil to talk together about their rights. One of the speakers is a woman named Alice Fletcher. She's an early ethnographer and anthropologist, and she tells this story to the audience of women from around the world. She talks about being with a woman, a group of women from the Omaha nation. Now, this is a Plains nation. And this is way over in what's now Nebraska. And she says, I was sitting with this group of women, and one of them gave away a horse. And he just gave somebody a horse. And I, without thinking, said, oh, hadn't you better check with your husband? She said, the merriment with which my statement was met by all these Native women, these Indian women were just laughing their heads off. What the heck? Why would you check with your husband? She said, I had just forgotten for a minute that I was with Indian women. That in, in most of the states, well, actually all of the states, before the women's rights movement, when a woman married, she became dead in the law. It wasn't that she lost her rights. A married woman ceased to exist legally. She was no longer a legal entity. The two became one in the Christian belief system, and that one was the man. Matilda Jocelyn Gage said this was really based on the story of Eve in the Bible in Genesis, where because of the sin of Eve, God declares that woman is to be under the authority of man. And she goes on, and so does Elizabeth Cady Stanton, to point out how this is in the Bible all the way to St. Paul. So it's a very strong Christian belief. And it becomes, canon law then, becomes common law. And the Blackstone Code says that once a woman marries, she is dead in the law. And do you remember that quote from Abigail Adams during the Revolutionary War period where she says to John, beware, unless, you know, if particular care and attention is not given to the ladies, we are prepared to foment a rebellion, basically of our own. She's referring to the Blackstone Code, which was just recently adopted in England. And she's basically saying, look, guys, you know, you're getting rid of the English uh, system of government. Don't pick up their repressive code for women. But the founding fathers do. And that becomes embedded in United States state law. So part of that was that once a woman married, everything she brought into the marriage became her husband's. And he could do with it whatever he wanted. Also, anything that she, any possessions that she inherited or earned 
during her marriage became his. So the Indian women couldn't even believe that this could be possible, but they saw it in practice and they told Alice Fletcher and she tells the International Council of Women that she is, that they tell her, Indian women are saying to her, they are really concerned about what's going to happen to them when they come under United States law, because they will be treated then as badly as white women are treated, as United States citizens are treated as women. So Alice gives that story. What about Matilda Jocelyn Gage? Well, Matilda Jocelyn Gage is president of the National Woman Suffrage Association in 1875. And she publishes a series of articles that are on the front page of the New York Evening Post. And the editor introduces the first of these articles saying, it's only appropriate that the president of the women's suffrage organization would write about the superior position of Indian women. And she does that and you know, huge readership. And she goes on to write about the Haudenosaunee in a series of subsequent articles. Let's cut to three years later. These are just pieces that begin to paint the whole picture. Three years later in 1878, Alice, uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage is editing the official newspaper, the official suffrage newspaper of the National Women's Suffrage Association. She's publishing it, she's editing it, and the chiefs at, at Onondaga are considering a, a law that is in the New York State Legislature that would give them the vote. In her suffrage paper, Matilda Jocelyn Gage writes an editorial supporting the decision of the chiefs. The chiefs in council, all 50 chiefs, as they met Matilda Jocelyn Gage writes, long before Columbus, were meeting at Onondaga, the center where they all meet, and they said, we will not accept citizenship in New York State. We are citizens of our own nations. Matilda Johnson Gage supports this decision, writes about it, lets suffragists know what's going on. She says, this is the greatest hypocrisy that the government is trying to force citizenship on Indian men, the better to steal their lands, while it's denying it to its own women citizens who are demanding the vote. She goes on to say, these nations, these Indian nations, are sovereign nations, every bit as much as Canada and Mexico. And attempting to force citizenship on them is like attempting to force it on Canadians and Mexicans. Justice to the Indians, she writes, requires living up to the treaties that we have with them. And then she goes on as an activist to say, you know, maybe we should learn from some of their tactics, like here's one. Last New Year's, the a group of Indian chiefs went to the White House uh, during calling time and New Year's, and they each had their calling cards and presented them to the president. And on the back of each of those cards was a broken treaty. And she says, yeah, it's a good tactic. Maybe we should learn from them. The same year she introduces a resolution into the National Women Suffrage Association that's adopted that talks about how the way in which husbands take the wages of their wives, which they could legally do, is comparable to the Indian agents, the white agents who are assigned by the government to carry out the treaty obligations of the government. In other words, you, you buy land, you pay for it. And the paying for it was done largely through uh, food at the time, food distribution. But what a lot of these white agents were doing was instead of giving the food that was for the Indians, they would take it themselves, they would sell it, and they would keep the profits. And the Indians 
in some cases we're going hungry or starvation that happened. And she says, you know, it's the same thing. Why women who are married, married women are being treated in the United States in the same way that Indians are treating, treated by the Indian agents. She makes that connection. In 1893, and this is just, you know, one more, there are other things going on with her at the time, but this is probably the most telling story. In 1893, Matilda Jocelyn Gage is given an honorary adoption into the Wolf Clan of the Mohawk Nation and she's giving she's given a, a real name, an authentic clan name, Hoana Howie. And the way that the names work is that they're usually given at birth, but the clan mother, as I understand it, has what they often call a bag of names. And it's all the names that belong to that clan. And when someone with the a, a clan name passes that name goes back to the clan mother and she puts it in the, in the bag of names to be used again. And the name that Matilda Jocelyn Gage was given, Hoana Howie in 1893, means literally uh, she who holds the sky or sky carrier. And that name is still in use. It's in use at Aquasasne today. It's never gone out of use, um, I imagine. And I'm Facebook friends today with the woman who has that name, the Wolf Clan Mohawk woman who carries that same name. Um, the same year that Matilda Jocelyn Gage is given this honorary adoption, she writes to her sisters or her, no, she writes actually to her daughter, she has no sisters. She writes to her daughter and says that her clan sisters are considering her for a position on the Council of Matrons, and that would give her a say in the choosing of the chief. The same year, she is arrested for voting in her own nation. She's been part of the New York State Women's Suffrage Association that in 1880 fought and won the right for women to vote in school board elections, local school board elections. And Gage is pushing the envelope in 1893, testing the law to see if she can, under that law, vote for a state position, school superintendent. And she's arrested for doing it. She's voting illegally. She loses the case. But the same year that she's arrested for voting in her own nation. She is considered for a voting voice in this consensus uh, decision-making process of the uh, Wolf Clan of the Mohawk Nation. A couple of other things about the writings that Stanton and Gage do about the position of Haudenosaunee women and the comparison with women in the United States. After the Civil War, there was a great movement on the part of women to end war. They sent their sons, their husbands, their fathers off to a war that they had no say in the decision making of. And uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage writes with wonder at how the Haudenosaunee women have the final say, the absolute say, in decisions of war and peace. They also have the final decision about the land. And the sacredness, as I understand it, and I'm, I'm, I'm pushing now because I'm an, I'm an outsider uh, trying to describe something that is really most appropriately and most accurately described by uh, an insider, a, a, a Haudenosaunee woman. But I'll tell you the best I understand it and have been sort of taught to understand it, um, is that um, the position of women, the understanding of women is considered to be the same as the understanding of Mother Earth. 
that they hold a sacred position, both of them, because they are the creators of life and life being the most sacred thing of all and they being the creators of it have uh, an, a, a, a status, a, a respect as sacred. One of the ways that manifests itself, and this I found in publications for, I went through 300 years of accounts of, of uh, na non-Native people writing about Native people and everything from initial um, missionaries and uh, explorers to newspapers as late as the 1880s, 1890s, they described the same thing, which is an absence of violence against women. In the um, Sullivan Clinton campaign, uh, one of the one of the generals writes after the uh, colonial soldiers have uh, raped some Onondaga women. Um, he he writes about he writes to the commander who is in charge of that regiment and says, you know, the the uh, Indian men don't rape even those women that they've taken captive. Perhaps our soldiers could learn something from these savages, and he uses the word savage. Um, the newspapers, there's accounts of uh, one, I'll tell you one story. It's in uh, one of the New York papers, and this was in the 1880s. And it's a reporter that comes to Oneida territory, and, and he's traveling along and visiting with people and he's traveling along a, a road that's that's pretty vacant nobody's around and there is a woman walking down the road he says an attractive young woman and he he you know brings his horse over and stops and says uh what are you doing here aren't you afraid and she turns on him i mean she's she sounds like from his report she's a little bit angry at him for suggesting that she says look i'm a teacher here i have i can go anywhere i want any time of the day or night and i am treated with the utmost civility um i taught in a nearby village and i would you know i was afraid to go out she said you ask any of the school teachers around here they'll tell you the same thing we are treated better on an indian nation and we have no fear for our safety when we're here. And so those accounts of absence of violence against women are just, they, they're everywhere. Um, things like the economics, um, the, the uh, Haudenosaunee women, like all the indigenous women from South America to North America, are the agriculturalists. They're the farmers. They're the ones who are planting the crops and they're planting corn, beans, and squash. Nutritionally perfect food if it's taken together and, and actually environmentally perfect. The uh, beans set the nitrates in the soil for the corn. The, uh, the corn stalk supports the squash or supports the beans as they climb so they can reach the sun. And the squash creates a, a monoculture that holds the, the moisture in, the, the uh, corn uh, roots are, are shallow, and this keeps the, the soil moist. And it also, that those prickly squash leaves, you know, birds and critters aren't gonna wanna run on them. So the women, because they're the agriculturalists, control the economy. Now that's looking at it from an outsider's view. You know, if you're looking at uh, who has the authority of determining the resources of the community, and it's the women with the Haudenosaunee. So uh, how does that manifest itself? Well, if let's just say that there were the group of, of warriors who decided they wanted to, to go off to war, they would have to get food moccasins from the women. And the women not only have the spiritual authority to determine war and peace, but they also have the economic backing of it uh, through being the agriculturalist. So when uh, Stanton and, and Gage and Maud and Fletcher and some of the other suffragists, when they looked at their own position, they had no right to their children. 
a husband could will away an unborn child in New York State. He's dying. On his deathbed, he writes a will. And he says, when this child is born that my wife is carrying, I want it to be given to this person to raise as the rightful owner. And the wife had no recourse, none, no recourse whatsoever. Um, a husband could, he had the right to beat his wife as long as he did not inflict permanent damage. And up until the second wave of feminism in the 1980s, husbands had the right to rape their wives in every state in the union. And the rape laws were written in this way. Rape is an act of unlawful sexual intercourse with someone other than the wife of the perpetrator. So here were women who had no legal existence, who were told that they should not want equality because from the pulpit they were often hearing, um, you know, women are to be obedient to their husbands. And so if a woman stood man's equal, her husband's equal at the ballot box, it would destroy God's divine plan of women being under the authority of men. And if you don't believe the Bible, then you better believe biology because science is saying the same thing. Women are not as smart as men. They are not as strong as men. And women are the clinging vine holding on to the mighty oak of the man for support. So the women who had no identity, no right to their bodies, no right to their children, no right to their possessions, no political voice, saw women who had all of those things. And once they saw that in practice, it became possible. And I think that was the ultimate inspiration for the women's rights movement. So, Patrick, shall we take some questions? Absolutely. Um, so if we have any questions about uh, any portion of tonight's presentation or any other questions for Dr. Wagner, please feel free to go ahead and type them into the chat box. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, I'll start off the questions. Um, I, when I was in grad school, I did a lot of research on uh, particularly uh, the dispossession of the Seneca Nation. Um, and though I didn't explore gender roles too much, it was, it was much more political research uh, that you see is as Seneca land was taken and, and Haudenosaunee land in general, you see Euro-Americans attempting to turn Haudenosaunee gender roles on their heads. So you see the attempts to make the Haudenosaunee men the farmers as opposed to the women. Um, and just want to get your, you know, and particularly when Sir William Johnson was alive, you saw some more uh, sort of deference to the traditional gender roles, but post-revolution, definitely a uh, forced change. Do you want to have any comments about, uh, about that? Yes, absolutely. And the irony of it and the painful reality of it is that as Haudenosaunee women were giving women of the United States a vision of this is what equality looks like in practice, the government and the churches were, were ruthlessly attempting to destroy the spiritual, the cultural, the political foundations of the Haudenosaunee. The idea was to Christianize and civilize. It's that, that white Christian exceptionalism, that we're the chosen people, that we're the best, we've got the best answers, and it's, you know, noblesse oblige that we're, that we're giving this to other people. And, um, and, and the result was a, a form of genocide. And the reality that is extraordinary is that despite the strongest attempts, the taking, the stealing of children and putting them in boarding schools where they were regimented. And what we know now is that they were systematically sexually abused and physically violated as well. And, um, you know, this process of, these are children who are put, if you can imagine, 
at the age of maybe five, they're put into essentially military training. There is no love, there is no tenderness, there is no connection to their culture. And sometimes they're kept there until they're 18. Then they're sent back and they have no idea who they are. The, the, the intergenerational post-traumatic stress that Native nations suffer today because of that, um, you know, well-intentioned of the best, you know, kindest Christians around, uh, it was you know, beginning to take accountability for it, many of the Christian denominations. Uh, but it was, um, you know, it was a horrendous thing. So. Uh, Patricia asked if you were able to talk a little bit about the American Voter Act of 1924. The, the uh, Citizenship Act, yeah, that was, now, what that did was that made Native people dual citizens. And Native nations, as I've, as I've learned, are not united about whether or not they'll vote. You know, I have friends at Onondaga who travel to Europe on their Haudenosaunee passports. They are not citizens of the United States. Um, and they have not accepted dual citizenship. But then you have, you know, two Native women who have been elected to Congress. And another, the other side of that argument is if I've heard Native people say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so it's, you know, we need to have a voice in order to protect ourselves. But um, the, uh, the Citizenship Act of 1924 gave dual citizenship to Native people. And that meant that they presumably were able to vote after that point if they chose to. Of course, we know the voter suppression that continues with all people of color today and is getting worse as we go into this next election. And it's been used with Native people. Uh, I think the case in, in uh, the last election in North Dakota is one that got a lot of attention where uh, law was, was introduced into the need, uh, North Dakota legislature and passed that said that if you didn't have a physical address, you couldn't vote. Well, reservations don't have physical addresses often. So it was a form of voter suppression. The, uh, the good news is that the legislator that introduced that bill was defeated in the last election by a native woman. But not every story of voter suppression has that happy an ending. One of the questions I saw is, do they have rights? Oh, and oh yeah, sorry, sorry, yes. I uh, sort of didn't, I, I started out with that and didn't quite follow up, so please let me if I might. Um, the wonder is that, that Native nations, not just the Haudenosaunee, but Native nations despite this incredibly vicious, I would call it, attempt to, to um, you know, the boarding school experience was to kill the Indian and save the man. The attempt to turn them into, you know, the dominant culture uh, prototypes or, or, you know, representatives of the, the dominant culture. Despite that, Native nations have maintained an extraordinary amount of their autonomy and they are not only maintaining sovereignty in many cases they are they are redeveloping sovereignty i grew up in south dakota and a case that happened a couple of months ago was that the uh, governor of south dakota would would put out no um, social distancing, no masking, no COVID regulations. The native nations, um, Shine River, for example, they had uh, the, the COVID regulations. And so they established their sovereignty and said, you can't come into our nation if you have not been practicing safe, um, you know, safety guidelines. And so they, they stopped 
South Dakota citizens at their borders. And they had to go through a whole form to indicate you know, where they'd been. And, and, and the nations were determining whether or not they'd uh, allow non-Native people to come on to their, their lands, which makes perfect sense. You know, it's like we were doing that with Europe, right? The United States was. So here were sovereign nations that were practicing that. Well, the governor of, uh, of South Dakota um, went up against it and was going to force them to let South Dakota citizens enter their lands. And there was such an outcry that she backed off and they, they established. So it's, it's reestablishing citizenship piece by piece. And I think the other thing is that uh, Lakota women, Lakota and Dakota women, who, you know, the anthropologists have told us for years that they're a patriarchal culture, just like, you know, the, the United States. And Lakota women are saying, no, that is not our tradition. And they're going back to the grandmothers and the stories before the, uh, the anthropologists came in and told them who they were. And they're claiming, no, we are sovereign women in sovereign nations. I was driving through Pine Ridge Reservation with a friend of mine. This is quite a few years ago, a Lakota friend. And she was just pointing out, you know, I know some of the people there and she's pointing out, oh yeah, and over there is where that, that guy lives, his aunties just put him up as, as chief um, uh, last year. And I said, Karen, don't lie to me. Haven't you read The Anthropologist? You don't have that form of system. The Lakota are patriarchal. There is no, well, no, the Tayoshpehs continue the same practices. Um, so we had a good laugh then, but it was sort of like, mm, uh, enough said. <laughs> so, yeah. So you, you see the question, Rosh, you wanted to know yeah. just so that she understands how how they set up the chiefs in each longhouse. Yeah, every clan has a a, a sachem, a good man, and a clan mother. And they are the ones responsible for ensuring the well-being of everybody and that clan and the nation and, you know, Mother Earth, they also have the responsibility for. And, um, and they, uh, it's a position that they hold as long as they're being appropriate. And every decision made has to be made with the seventh generation in mind. What is the effect of this decision going to be for those who come after us in seven generations? And the chief, if seven is a, is a, a used number, the chief is said to need to have skin that is, is seven layers thick because he will be criticized. And a, a friend of mine from Anadari the other day was just saying to me, you know, we choose our chiefs based on their character. No one is perfect, but we look to character. What is the character of this person? And that's how we make a decision. Because if he has a good character, we can work with him. How is the clan mother chosen? That's, you know, that one, I, I you know, Patrick, a, a great follow-up at some point would be to have a real authority, a Haudenosaunee <laughs> woman, and boy, do I know some great speakers for you to get. There's also a new film that just came out, uh, Without a Whisper, that is the story of the Haudenosaunee influence on women's rights. Um, we're going to be showing it for the Gage Foundation tomorrow night. It's just been released. But um, uh, so as an outsider, there are times when I will not try to answer a question because I don't feel like I have a depth of understanding enough to really, um, to really be able to speak to it. Uh, and that's what I will do with that very important question. 
I've always wondered why was Gage adapted into uh, Mohawk clan? Why wasn't she adapted into Onondaga? Onondaga, yeah. Um, she was in New York City. And, you know, the, the iron workers were, came down, the Mohawks came down, and they actually built the skyscrapers in New York City. And um, they, they could walk the iron in a, in a way with, with incredible balance. Uh, still can and and uh, so they were an entire communities would go down and um, and it was the uh, Mohawks in New York City that uh, that adopted honorarily you know there's different kinds of adoption Pete Jemison who's the director of Ganondigan in a Gondol Chiefs Seneca says that there are um, eight different types of adoption and Matilda's was um, was an honorary one. You know, the writing out of history, I think, is after the National American Women's Suffrage Association becomes much more conservative and Gage drops out because it's moved in that direction. And she really gets written out of history. And so does the story of the Haudenosaunee influence, because these women were courting the Southern racists and they were making racist arguments and they did not want any semblance of honoring women of color um, to interfere with their courting the white supremacists in the South. Do we have any other, it's a, you have a very great comment. This was a fantastic and informative lecture and given we have a pretty important election coming up, it's the perfect time to have lectures and conversations like this. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a great comment to end our night on tonight. Uh, Dr. Wagner, thank you for joining us. Thank you for this presentation. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their evening. Thank you, Patrick. I really enjoyed working with you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Have a great rest of your evening. You too. Thank you. Good night, everybody.